So, in the book of Genesis, we read of two accounts of creation. And this is something that Jews and Christians have been discussing for quite some time, and it's not settled. I want to chime in and show you something that I think is really, really interesting. Now, back in Gnostic Sunday School number three, I introduced you again to this uh, gestalt view of biogeometry or God's divine geometry. These biological patterns, symbols embedded in language in the scripture that maps onto what appears to be a precognitive awareness of modern biological science thousands of years ago. So are we looking at precognition, something we could call predictive programming? Are these just patterns from a collective unconscious, subconscious, or is something else going on here? I've tried to articulate some of these ideas referring to the co-creative faculty, and I recommend people take a look at Reverend Dr. Malcolm Geit talking about Coleridge's play, The Mariner in regards to how a collective or co-creative faculty is a truth-bearing faculty that seems to have a precognitive element in Coleridge's life in that in his early 20s he writes this epic poem that embeds patterns he then lives through. Now let's go back to Genesis and this idea of the patterns of biological chemistry embedded in the body and in the earth and we go a step deeper in the book of Revelations, I talked about how this number of 616 and 666 are associated with the number of Nero in Greek gematria. We get two different numbers. We also have this idea of carbon-based life forms being embedded, knowledge of the science of the carbon-based life form embedded in biblical scripture that points towards a number we are advised that he who has wisdom can decipher this number. Wisdom in Greek is Sophia. This is a woman's name as well as an idea about uh, Gnosis. Uh, St. Paul goes into this in Ephesians 1 when he promises God delivers to the faithful and the predetermined knowledge of their divine inheritance. And I believe that scientific understanding, when it is pursued in the name of truth, beauty, and celebrating the beauty and overall ineffably complex gift that we've been giving, given in human consciousness that appears to be collectively and collaboratively creating and co-creating this experience that may or may not be generated by consciousness, not matter in the brain creating consciousness through some magic of neurons. So we have this idea of 666 or 616 being the number of the beast. And I mentioned stable carbon has six protons, six neutrons, and six electrons. And we have this idea of the protons and neutrons being in that center. So these protons and neutrons are uh, like Earth. And then we have two circles of electrons orbiting around this field in the nucleus. And so we have something like um, the heavenly bodies in the dome above the earth and then in a deeper cosmos. And so the electrons represent the stars and the planets, as well as this cosmological pattern mapping onto the biological chemistry that seems to be at the core of all life on earth that we know of. Now scientists and sci-fi writers have speculated about um, the potential of having a uh, organic, substance made of silicon and not carbon or a non-organic life form or a non-carbon life form but we haven't found any and we haven't created any as far as we know so christ is born in a stable or a manger and now we're told christ becomes man and flesh he is god but also man and sacrifices his own fleshly life and self so we have christ going through a rite of passage as a human but also we have christ born into that carbon and this is the number of a man, and it's the number of the beast. I believe what we're told in symbolic language that we're meant to understand now is that carbon-based life forms are this creation in which something of God is infused with something of material. And we are in that interesting world in between. 
And I've pointed out that the mandorla, the almond, or the commonly referred to as the vesica Pisces, is a bit of a, a map of the world in which God's mind and our individuated consciousness is meeting in the middle. We could have something like um, a conversation of the left and right brain mediated by the corpus callosum being the Christ consciousness or something not entirely unlike that Jiminy Cricket conscience voice, higher self that tells us uh, when we're receiving a, a let's say a positive intimation or having a bad idea that might be the result of bad pattern and selfish interests. So we have carbon and uh, the carbon science in the 666. We also have this idea of if we have 666 representing the nucleus, the outer circle and inner circle of the electrons, then it looks like five of the electrons have gone off and we consider that to be radioactivity, right? So we have some free floating ions. Now let's take a look at uh, the difference between these two numbers, 666 and 616. The difference is 50. So we have 666 or 616. These are numbers that are used by Marvel Comics. There's a Marvel Comics Cinematic Universe and another universe that's called Marvel World 616. So this is interesting. I've talked about how today's mythology is sometimes inspired and maps on patterns that we find, you know, have been repeating since old scripture. So definitely biblical and other religious patterns embedded in the Marvel comics. And they play up the Norse stuff and obfuscate the, uh, the Christian and, I and Jewish iconography. But it's in there and it's obvious. And it's not a conspiracy theory. The Jewish roots of superhero mythology in the 20th century are well documented. Now, is there a point to this? You and your board are idolaters. So anyway, 616 and 666 are 50 apart. The difference is 50. And in Roman numerals, L, the letter L is 50. This is 50, L. So I'm thinking of 50 ions. We have 666 protons, neutrons, electrons. Now, when we have protons and neutrons in that center, they stay in the nucleus. And then we have that inner circle and outer circle. And that's where covalent bonds are made. And that's where radioactivity and free-floating ions dissipate from that outer ring and go off. That's kind of like a wandering star or a shooting star. So we have this idea that there is, let's say, um, a free-floating ion mapping onto the wandering Jews in the desert. And that information and that symbolism maps onto what I talked about previously in Gnostic Sunday School 9, with the radioactivity and Christ sending out the 70 or 72 disciples, two by 35 or two by 36. Now these numbers and patterns and language can be interpreted in a modern lens through reader response theory, which is something like a Valentinian Gnostic exegesis of inspired script that has an unveiling manifold meaning that changes over the years. So. If it's co-authored by the Holy Spirit, there's no telling what it could do. Really, it's that simple. <laughs> and I've articulated this in number seven, Gnostic, number, uh, Gnostic Sunday School 7 with Eat the Lion. We talk about eating the lion, representing the lion and the pride, but also symbolism of the radioactivity. So people are being, uh, let's say they're losing something of themselves, and then they collect in something that is also radioactive. So they're giving away electrons and swapping electrons and the new electrons have a bad pattern or bad vibration that causes them unwellness and negative, negative consequences. These patterns map onto spiritual warfare as well as depleted uranium in the desert, as well as Christ sending out two by 35 or two by 36 disciples, including Jason, number 45, into the desert and out into that wilderness in order to cast out demons, heal the sick, and also deliver the good news. My job here is to deliver the good news that there is an unfolding manifold wisdom that is not done revealing itself to us. That wisdom is Sophia. And in 1 Corinthians 1.30, we find St. Paul tells us himself that Christ becomes Sophia. So the Holy Spirit and Sophia are analogous. And that concept of Sophia 
and the Holy Spirit being one and the same goes back to even before the Christian movement with the wisdom, uh, the Sophia of Solomon, a Hellenistic Jewish book written in Greek using the term Sophia to describe a feminine aspect to the Holy Spirit. So we're told Christ loses his flesh and becomes like a radioactive spirit or ghost in the machine or ghost in the wilderness, the desert of the real, and we're being interacted with. He's represented as a lion in C.S. Lewis's famous Christian apologist mythology, The Chronicles of Narnia. So Aslan the lion is the L or 50 ions in the desert. So there's 50 radical free floating lions, lions, the Aslan, L ions, so we have 50 ions. Now think of 50 as 50% and this idea of spirit and flesh. So we're half spirit, half flesh. We're in the desert of the real, wandering around like radioactive wandering Jews, the wandering Jews of Zion, trying to get back to Zion, is trying to get back to that last covalent bond of final, final participation in which God fully reveals that inheritance to us, and you get a, a curtain revealed. Gnostics go through this death experience and a rebirth during their life, and we're charged with announcing this to other people that the death isn't the end, and that this system that we're living in is highly scientific and explainable. If you're aiming to explain this with truth beauty, then these things will be revealed to you. So the two worlds of 666 and 616 are something like an imaginary world of spirit, and then the world of the L, the lion, right? And that's the 50 ions, that's the, the material world. So the 666 is the world that has the material flesh added to the 616. 616 is the Bible. 616 pictographically looks like B-I-B. Then we have L-E. Le Bible. The Bible. L's Bible. So we have the Word. It is an imaginary realm. 616. And then it is spoken into existence. There is a vibration that collects ions or free-floating material, microscopic subatomic particles coalesce. There's a pattern, there's information in these things. They map onto the stars and they map onto the atoms in your body as well as to the proportions and the way in which your body breathes in spirit and pneuma and breath and the way in which you take in material and through the alchemical furnace of your stomach and digestive system, you break that down, turn that into energy, and then use that energy to pursue truth beauty so that you can give glory to God's creation, which is amazing, it's scientific, it's understandable, and I'm proving it. Um, we have two orders of creation explained. We got the BIB Bible, and then we have the physical world, the 666, and that is the L. The L is added to the ions. And then we have the lion in the desert or in the jungle. The king of the jungle goes into the desert. So this is the story of Christ in the desert. C.S. Lewis was an inspired, uh, inspired Christian apologist who was working with the Holy Spirit. And so his truth beauty that he manifests in the 20th century is a beloved modern mythology that adds more information to this human condition that is constantly unfolding and revealing itself through our relationship with the Holy Spirit, Sophia, that is Christ sent from the Father who announced this through St. Paul in Ephesians 1. So you're in the material world, you can go back to the conceptual world, but God thought you were good enough to breathe into existence. Let's start acting like it, maybe. I don't know. All right. Yeah, I'll, uh, I think that's about it. Thanks for coming out. Good night. God bless, guys.